Hey guys, welcome to Cinematographs. This is my series where I spend a whole month binge watching films of a certain theme, then ranking and talking about them here. This month we have 16 French New Wave films, and we might be missing some iconic works during this period, but I was trying to spread the list out through multiple directors. Needless to say, there's still a lot to talk about, so I'm just gonna... I was excited to see this because I thought the concept of the film literally being called Claire's Knee was funny, and I kept these hopes up for the first half of the film. I felt like everything was being set up well, nothing was too slow, and there was good dialogue going on. The characters sort of had weird dynamics already, with Laura being 16, but I just brushed that off in hopes that the rest of the film could change my mind. But the thing is, the film is missing a lot. Claire doesn't appear until an hour into the film, and they don't really interact until the last 20 minutes. It's not a romance, and it's not a comedy either, because I feel as if everything that happens in the film is taken seriously, even though as the viewer you're kind of weirded out. And this is part of Romare's moral tales, so it does touch on taboo subjects and probably isn't doing anything it's not intending to, but I don't find that that's the reason why I should be watching it. It doesn't necessarily employ anything new that could be found on other films in this list, and it was missing some aesthetic or mood that could add some oomph to it. I'm not gonna say a lot about this one because I think compared to everything else here, Bay of Angels falls more in the shadows, and everything I'm going to talk about for Breathless applies to this as well. The concept for Bay of Angels was more interesting than Breathless, but it doesn't have the same level of charm as that one, and it also stylistically doesn't achieve much. I found myself watching the film but not really taking anything in. Initially, I liked the characters more and thus was pretty optimistic about everything, but by the end I didn't feel like any development was happening. There wasn't ever any tension or stakes to make the film what on paper it should be, but I do enjoy the little piano score that comes on throughout. I cannot remember a single thing about this film, and I watched this a couple days before my time writing this. I remember the plot, but everything else is just bits and pieces, and there wasn't ever one scene that stuck out to me. I really wish I enjoyed this and all of the other films I'm kind of ranking in this category better, but I physically could not. Maybe it's because of their kind of film noir vibes, which ironically is a genre that I don't like watching, but I was hoping for there to be more to dig into with the films, I guess. This might be a controversial opinion. In my mind, there's nothing wrong with the film, because there isn't really, but in my heart, something just isn't clicking. I never fully felt connected to these characters or their relationships with each other, and as a result, the film felt so long despite only being 90 minutes, and that 90 minutes ended up being a bit dull. And I hate calling it dull because I feel like stylistically it's not. I love the editing, how it breaks continuity, and the way it's used in dialogue scenes. I thought the sound was really great and gorgeous actually, and unlike the past two films, I did have some good moments of investment here and there. But I don't really see any reason for me to rewatch it, except if I wanted to study its style. And I think it achieves everything the director wanted to achieve, it's just that what it achieves is not interesting to me outside of its technical elements, and that's not enough to carry it. And when I compare it to the other Godard films here, it seems pale in comparison. Though I would never be surprised to hear if someone did or didn't like Breathless. This one probably just comes down to personal taste. You know how some of my complaints from before were that it was difficult for me to see, understand, or connect with a character? Yeah, it's the complete opposite here because each person in Jules and Jim has a vibrant touch to them. There's both good and bad parts of each character, but in general I had to suspend my belief of what a normal person was for this film. Or maybe these personality traits and behaviors were normal back in the 60s when this was made, I don't know. But either way, I also think Jules and Jim has a good ability to create an unnatural bubble inside the real world. Like, the film does take place in France and Austria, and that's all normal, but it seems like the lives of these three people are something different from that. It's almost magical. At the same time, there does seem to be some real truths to life in the film. Messages of loyalty, friendship, and love. I laughed at some parts, but I was also thinking other moments were very sweet. The film is unpredictable, but it does take its time with that. It slowly progresses into this unhinged and confusing chaos that is constantly getting worse. I think by the end, I found my interest slipping because I was getting tired and tired of everything. I enjoyed it, but as I look back on it, I don't feel the need to rewatch it, especially in comparison to everything else after this. 
Eyes Without a Face is horrific. That's the big thing about it. And when I read the film's synopsis, I knew watching it would be chilling. I hate body horror stuff, but especially anything near the face and neck. And there's actually like a five minute scene that shows this transplant happening, and I really had to look away from that one. And despite that being a driving factor in the film's horror, the first half still does a great job in building that unsettling feeling without that type of scene. From just the simple but effective white mask Christian wears to the POV shots, I was very uncomfortable. When they revealed what Christian looked like without the mask, it was like a jump scare. On top of that, there are some messages present that could be talked about, and a moral situation because you feel bad for the girl, but at the same time you don't know whether or not that's wrong because of everything that's happening related to her. And you spend a lot of the film wondering if she is good or bad in the situation as she kind of floats around in this neutral area of complicity. But yeah, I wouldn't call it an enjoyable watch because it was more disturbing than anything, but definitely an effective film. <laughs> A Woman is a Woman kind of remind me of La La Land mixed with all that jazz, which the director of is actually mentioned in the film, so maybe that means something special. I feel like it has similar elements in the desires of the characters, primary color scheme, and musical fun tone. It's relaxing and makes me feel like I can let out a deep breath. Being less than an hour and a half, it moves quickly so nothing feels unnecessary or dragged out, and this was the fastest watching experience out of all the films on this list. Anna Karina's performance obviously is masterful and is the unapologetic star of the film. For what it is, I honestly don't think I have anything but praise for this one. It's simple, fun, stylish, and gets the fundamentals right. Same director as A Woman is a Woman here, but I think this film has a slight edge over that one because of how much more it goes with everything, and as a result, it's a lot more interesting. You can tell watching it that it's simply full of choices, a lot of which weren't very common at this time, I believe, and it sort of expands my initial understanding of what the French New Wave style is. The two main characters whose actors had been in the two previously mentioned Godard films mesh well together in this, I guess, quirky world. I feel as if I would never actually be able to explain a lot of the scenes here to anyone, but there's something so satisfying and entertaining about the way the film is formed. I would be very okay with watching it again, outside of its value to the actual movement itself. Same director as Piero Lefou here, but now this one has the edge because I enjoyed the moodiness of it. The film probably contains some of my favorite dialogue scenes and actual character representation. That's not me saying that these main characters were my favorite of all of the 16 movies on this list, but that I liked the way they were presented. The conversations felt candid, which given how lively the film is, could have been difficult to achieve. And I feel like it grants some look into the state of France post-war, and I don't know, I think there's something special about the way it does that. Also, that like, crack noise at the beginning of some vignettes. I loved it and I think it was a nice addition that was like a cherry on top. I have a lot of admiration for this film. It's endlessly happy and very much itself. And it's not that easy for me to get into stuff like that, but the film just oozes with this charm and creates an addicting world. Watching it was like this bright spot in my day and it made me want to burst into song or something. In my opinion, The Young Girls of Rochefort embodies the heart of French New Wave in the sense that a lot of these films are very romantic or include a love story in some way, but this film really takes those ideas of love and puts it on display through a unique lens. It was a little crazy but still treated its characters with some respect and in a cheesy way, self-love. And I found that extremely alluring and frankly, cool. I probably will never see a more elegant film than last year at Marion Bad. First of all, the cinematography is stunning, and that shouldn't be a surprise because it's also stunning in Hiroshima Mon Amour, one of my spoiler favorites from this period, but somehow this film kicks it up a notch. All of the images in that opening sequence, I don't even know how to describe it other than I was entranced. And the set design? 
There aren't too many locations in play here, so it seems like they went all out on what they did have. The pieces are so rich and regal, and also the film plays with time and its background characters in such a defining way. There are points where everyone in the setting will stand still, as if we're traveling through a memory. All of this contributes to the overall mood, because moody is the second biggest word I'd use to describe this film. It's moody in how the characters speak to each other, in how they long to recapture those moments and hold on to something that's slipping away as the film progresses. I can't say I understood every second of the film, but I did enjoy every second of the film. I'm a sucker for some of the classics, and I think this is what this is here. It's been a while since I've watched The 400 Blows for the first time, and I had initially rated it a 10 out of 10, but this was the very last film I watched this month, and I was wondering how it would match up against the other 10 out of 10s, because those you'll see I'm very fond of. But on my rewatch, my rating actually just solidified. I honestly forgot just how depressing the film was the whole way through. From the beginning, Truffaut sets up this feeling that no matter what the kid does, it's just not good enough. And the first time I watched this, I had no idea that the story was based on Truffaut's own experiences as a kid. But seeing this again, it makes a lot of sense because the film feels extremely personal, from the little bits of dialogue to a shot's deliberate focus on a character's reaction. And I won't comment on any more of it because it's probably all been said before, but I also need to say that I appreciate how the kid starts off in these tight, cramped spaces, and when he runs off at the end, he finally gets a taste of his open freedom. That That's all, sorry. <laughs> this blew my mind. Going into it, I didn't really know what to expect, but just the description of it was enough to pique my interest. If you haven't seen this film before, it's not actually like a motion picture. It's a series of pictures weaved together with sound, diegetic and non-diegetic. And it's impressive how well this managed to capture my attention despite this. It never feels like the lack of actual video is a constraint. In fact, I would argue that it being still is what makes it, it. Not to mention the storytelling and overall tone. I was unsettled the entire time. I watched it late at night by myself in a room, and it's not really meant to be a horror, I don't think, but if you look at some of these images, they are startling. The main character is in this dark, cave-like room being experimented on by people with masks. There were times where I felt exposed and looked behind me to make sure nobody was sneaking up on me. I think the overall power of it is unassuming at first, but I've never had a watching experience like this since I saw Come and See for the first time. And that is probably the most bold but true claim I will ever make because it got me that bad. It creates this unusual and almost dystopian world that represents some point in the future, and it's terrifying. It's 30 minutes, but those obviously fly by like nothing. This is a film that I would get everyone I know to see, as it's just so weird, unique, and haunting. This is the other rewatch I did this month. Hiroshima Monomore was always something I admired and thought of frequently, particularly the opening scene and this set of shots here. That kind of style with the lighting, overall feelings of angst, and themes of memory drew me in. There's a lot to both feel and wonder about between the two characters, and the connection between memories, romance, and war in the film can't be articulated fully, but it's there. This moved up from a 9 out of 10 to a 10 out of 10 just because the second time around, I understood it more and could thus keep up with it more. It's just a breathtaking film from start to finish. Army of Shadows is, I guess, one of the outliers on this list because it doesn't really contain the same narrative or style as anything else. It still centers around people, but the setting is completely different, taking place during the war. It's a more serious tone and based in reality. It's a film I would love to see talked about more, if not for its narrative, than for the sort of undying spirit it has. It's as if you're watching in on all of these characters being given a passage into their secrets. You feel the tension, the heartbreak, the winds. Despite being the longest film this month, I was never bored or feeling like a scene was dragged way too long. Everything had its place. Some of the films from this list, especially from the beginning of the video, can kind of get muddled in my brain because I feel as if they are pretty similar, but here there are just so many things to look for. It is consistently high stakes and I can name more than a handful of powerful scenes, especially that ending which was the perfect culmination of the film's messages. One of the standouts from this month for sure. It's tragic and full of both hope and hopelessness. I 
found myself really drawn to and invested in Elevator to the Gallows in a way that I can't explain. It's effective at mainly two things. First, it sets up the threshold of suspense with quite a few stakes and keeps you there for most of the film. I was a little tired before I started watching this, but even then it managed to keep my attention and I felt involved in the story in the sense that I was wondering what each of the characters next move would be. Second, it structurally plays really well. There's cuts between like three different planes of action and there's basically two sets of main characters. But I found all of them equally interesting, which is hard to pull off. And each of their actions build off of one another and build these layers in the narrative and butterfly effects. I don't know, it's genuinely just a solid film that just snowballs into something greater. I could not point out anything it either needed or didn't need. The editing was great, the cinematography was great, the score was great, the performances, etc. I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop here and say this is one of my favorite crime thrillers I've seen. Okay, so that was a month of French New Wave. One of the things that surprised me about this month was just how many films had to do with romance and loss, and specifically the roles of men and women in that. Like, I had no idea that was something that was consistently explored in the movement, and I guess it makes some sort of sense coming out of World War II. Even still, with all of these similarities, each director seems to be so distinct in their contributions to the movement and how they relay these ideas. There was something different to take away from mostly each film I saw. And I have to admit that a lot of the lower rated movies here were watched towards the beginning of June, so I was worried about how this month was going to go, but it really redeemed itself after those first five or six films. But I can give those earlier films the benefit of a doubt and say that maybe I just wasn't used to those styles at first and ended up missing something crucial that makes those movie special watching experiences. And either way, it was an overall good month and I think there's something for everyone out of everything on this list. 